Welcome to Across Africa, our weekly look at stories from across the continent. I'm Georgia Calvin-Smith, and this week at COP26, richer countries are told to pull their heads out of the sand and deliver on climate change promises. Africa's paying dearly for environmentally destructive policies of developed nations. In Senegal, natural disasters are hitting rural agricultural communities hard. Also, COVID-19 has kept the border between DR Congo and the Republic of Congo closed for a year and a half. The impact on trade has left communities struggling. And over a century after they were looted by French colonizers, dozens of artifacts are finally back home in Benin. Our reporters head to Abome as the treasures are returned. But first, at the COP26 climate summit, a report revealed that eight out of the top 10 economies most economically impacted by climate change are in Africa. Topped by Sudan, the nation's GDPs could plummet by over 70% by the end of the century under current climate policy trajectory. In Senegal, natural disasters are already disrupting farming communities, as our team reports. Climate change has driven farmers like our to despair. Year after year, her tomato plants produce fewer and fewer fruit. It's because of climate change. It wasn't like this before. Back then, I used to harvest up to 20 boxes of tomatoes. Now I barely get two. Awa lives in Sasalgandiol in the center west of Senegal, a region that's been particularly affected by the drop in rainfall. Harvests of millet, the region's main food crop, have also fallen drastically. I can't even last two months with this. I can't describe the difficulties I am experiencing. Our harvests are a disaster. According to the latest report from the World Meteorological Organization, 2020 saw food insecurity in Africa increase by 40 percent. One organization is trying to help the women of Sasal Gandiol by teaching them about agroecology. The tree captures the water and moistens the soil. The organization's planted 150,000 trees since 2017. But their efforts only go so far. Rich countries must first rein in their greenhouse gas emissions. If the commitments of the Paris Agreement are not respected, it means that this COP26 is doomed to fail. It will be a total failure. These commitments must be respected. We must facilitate African countries' access to green finance. Wealthy nations have pledged $100 billion a year to finance the climate transition of southern countries from 2020. But as the end of 2021 draws near, the full promised amount still hasn't been delivered. In Tunisia, farmers have been fighting to preserve traditional irrigation techniques. Now, they are currently on the UN's list of agricultural heritage systems of global importance, but they're under threat from climate change. Laurent Berstecker has more. 60 kilometers north of the Tunisian capital, a patchwork of man-made islands stretches into the Mediterranean. Ali Garci has been cultivating this plot of land for over 20 years using an ancestral irrigation system, which now faces unprecedented challenges. The system, known as Ramli, which means sand in Arabic, was invented in the 17th century by Andalusian refugees. It uses fresh and sea waters, which are filtered through a mixture of sand and manure to irrigate the crops. The method's resistance to drought saw it recognized by the UN last year as a potential solution to recurring water shortages in North Africa, but its reliance on a fragile balance of rain and sea tides is being put to the test by climate change. In another warning that the Ramli system may be on its last legs, climate models suggest the extreme weather conditions of the summer, which saw record high temperatures and well below average rainfall, could become permanent in the near future. Now, the world's two closest capital cities are just four kilometers away from each other on either side of the Congo River. 
But for the past year and a half, travel between Brazzaville and Kinshasa has been hampered by the pandemic. Those who made a living crossing the river between DR Congo and the Republic of Congo are struggling. Clément Bonnero reports. At Brazzaville's beach, the city's main port area on the Congo River, most boats have remained at the quayside since the beginning of the pandemic. When the few boats still allowed to cross the border come into sight, baggage handlers scramble to make a few bucks. We don't make nearly as much money as before. We have problems paying our rents. We don't know what to do. We wish they could reopen the border so that we can go back to the way we were before. Uloj Aquala owns a transport and freight agency. He says his turnover has hit rock bottom. The flow of passengers on our boats has dropped overnight. People don't travel as much as they did before the pandemic. And when it comes to freight services as well, trade between the two cities has really gone down. In Brazzaville, many shop owners used to get their supplies from Kinshasa on the other side of the river. Now some items have become almost impossible to get hold of. Since they closed the borders, prices have increased a lot. Before the coronavirus, it wasn't like that, but now life has become very difficult for all of us. Despite growing economic difficulties, the government has so far refused to reopen the border with DR Congo, citing the COVID-19 pandemic as a major concern. There are countries, great powers, which have perfect control of the pandemic and which have almost reached full vaccination coverage. And yet they continue to restrict cross-border movement of people. The Republic of Congo is currently struggling with a third wave of infections, prompting it to announce a tightening of measures to stop the spread of the coronavirus. More than a century after French colonial troops looted treasure from a West African kingdom, 26 of the artefacts are finally home. They were taken from a palace in Abome, a city in what is now southern Benin. Their return marks the beginning of the first large-scale act of restitution by a former colonial power. Our team report. Palaces of Abome, built within the same enclosure and spread over 40 hectares, are classified as a World Heritage Site. These palaces are testament of the once glorious, well-organized kingdom that existed over three centuries until it vanished, defeated by the French. At the end of the 19th century, colonial troops plundered the Kingdom of Daomi under the reign of King Beonza. Given the aura of Behanza, of this ruler, everyone wanted to keep something from this king whose legendary power was praised. Kefas Igbajuglele is the 14th king since Beanza surrendered after two years of fierce resistance against the French. Even if the kings no longer have political power, they remain the guardians of traditional and religious customs. <laughs> My whole royal court and I are very happy. The whole population of Abomi feels the same way. It makes me very happy. I feel glad and healthy inside. The absence of these objects has made us sick. Since the royal treasures were taken away, replicas are used for royal ceremonies in this palace. For the moment, there aren't any plans to use the returned objects for worship. These are objects that already have national and international character. We will continue doing what we have done forever with these objects. I am happy, but there are still many objects to be recovered, like those of the Amazon women who lost their lives fighting against the French. What belonged to them was taken away by the colonizer. I would like all this to come back too. France started the restitution process with these 26 works. We believe that this is only the beginning, and we are sure that it's a movement that will not stop any time soon. Now home in their place of origin in Abomey, the 26 artefacts head to the Ouida Museum of History, known as the Portuguese Fort. It's been entirely renovated to temporarily house the royal treasures. Senegalese influencers on TikTok say that they're being overlooked. The social networking site has a billion users worldwide and recently opened a 250 million euro fund to pay US and EU content creators. African users say that's not good enough. 
They're Senegal's TikTok sensation. Dudu and Feynara often feature in videos together and perform sketches and parodies. But they don't understand why African countries have been left out from the TikTok Creative Fund. We create. There is original content. There is everything. Pay us. We need this. It would motivate us to continue. Why did they plan a budget, but not for Africa? Don't we have phones in Africa? Yes, we do. We have everything we need here. It's a shame, but I'm sure they'll realize this in the end. The feeling of injustice is shared by another TikTok creator who made name for himself by making funny videos. Mambala has over 300,000 subscribers. He says the Chinese company has double standards. TikTok must review its attitude towards Africans. As always, history repeats itself. We are marginalized. They don't involve us in serious things. And that's a shame. TikTok has announced on its website that it might apply changes to its creative fund without giving any more details. For this social network specialist, African TikTok users must fight to have equal opportunities as other content creators in Europe or the US. Today, content creators must themselves carry the fight to show that they have the ability to make things happen. The Senegalese creators dream of having the same success as Javi Lam, a Senegalese influencer based in Italy. With 116 million subscribers, he's the second most followed TikTok creator in the world and became a millionaire after just a few months on TikTok. Well, that's it for Across Africa for now. Thanks for joining us and do so again if you can. Till then, take care.